or let's talk about insomnia. I see this on a really regular basis. Sleep is probably one of the most important factors for your health. I tell patients, if you don't remember anything we ever talk about, being healthy is only three things. Sleep, diet, and exercise. If you're doing those well, you're in pretty good shape. When you look at the data, about 30% of people report that they have insomnia. Um, well, really only 5 to 15% of people will meet the formal criteria for chronic insomnia. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine defines insomnia as an impairment in the initiation, duration, consolidation, or quality of sleep that occurs despite adequate opportunity for sleep that results in some form of daytime impairment. You'll notice that none of that has to do with a number of hours. Um, it has to do with the inability to get the sleep that you're intending to get. And then chronic insomnia is diagnosed when patients have symptoms for greater than three months. So let's talk about an evaluation for insomnia. For starters, you want to make sure that you do a thorough evaluation with your doctor for anything that could be causing changes in your sleep pattern. And this is really broad because everything affects sleep, including caffeine intake, stress, thyroid hormone changes, changes in your workout routine. I typically will have patients come in. We do a thorough evaluation. We talk about what's going on in their personal lives. We talk about what's going on in their careers. We talk about stress levels. We do some blood work and check out their hormones. We do some blood work and make sure it's not changing kidney function or thyroid or electrolytes or liver function. Uh, we talk about recent travel. We talk about circadian rhythm disruptions. We talk about a ton of stuff. So it's worth it to have your doctor and go through a form evaluation of everything that could be causing changes in your sleep pattern before you start assuming that you have insomnia and looking for especially medications because that is not the first line treatment for insomnia. Now, a lot of patients that I talk to say that they are doing pretty good. They think that they're somewhat close. Um, they don't really have much concern about how much sleep that they get. Um, and they're sometimes not bothered by it. I would say it's worth it to try to get as close as you can to eight hours. Uh, and there's a couple reasons why. Number one is increase in dementia in patients who don't get enough sleep. There is a great study that came out um, in 2018 that looked at roughly 50,000 patients. And in this study, what they wanted to see was the correlation between people who didn't get enough sleep and then dementia down the road. First, they had to control for everything else that not enough sleep caused that then also caused dementia. So when they removed those things, primarily chronic kidney disease, high cholesterol levels, diabetes, chronic liver disease, and coronary artery disease, once those things were out of the picture, there was still a 217% increase in dimensions and people didn't get enough sleep. So you do want to get as close as you can to eight hours per night. Not everybody needs eight hours per night, but as they say, if you took the number of people who don't need eight hours per night and you rounded that to the nearest whole number, it'd be zero people. Eight hours is safe to assume that that's how much sleep you need. As a matter of fact, they did a separate study that Matthew Walker talks about in his book on sleep. This was a study where they split students into two groups, and they both had to learn a new set of material in order to be included in the study. And the first group pulled an all-nighter. Everybody knows all-nighters are bad for you, so of course their scores went down. Their memory, their attention span, and their problem-solving abilities the group number two missed the same eight hours of sleep, but just one hour a night for the next eight days. And their scores dropped just as much as the group who missed it all at once. So there's a lot to be said about cumulative fatigue that just builds up on you over time. Um, even missing one hour a night is enough to have some, some significant impacts. Now think about it this way. If you have a list of 20 things to do while you sleep, repair your muscles, um, convert short-term memory to long-term memory, balance your nervous system, help bring down your blood pressure. You got these 20 things that you need to do and you get 90% of the sleep you need. You don't get 90% of every one of those things done, you get 100% of some things and 0% of other things. So the majority of the cognitive improvements from sleep, your focus, your attention span, your memory, your problem solving abilities, those things aren't happening till hours six to eight. So getting seven hours is close numerically, but maybe it's only 50% of the brain boosting abilities that you need from sleep. The other question that I have and the common statement I hear from patients is, I get six hours and that must be enough for me. But let's stop and think about that. Is subjective daytime fatigue an adequate barometer for getting enough sleep? The answer is no. One of the first things you do when you sleep is clean up sleep drivers. Things like melatonin and adenosine that build up over the course of the day that make you feel sleepy. And once you clean those up, that's why a lot of people know that it's harder to get back to sleep in the middle of the night than it is to fall asleep at the beginning of the night. You lose some of that sleep momentum. So feeling fatigued during the day isn't necessarily a good measurement it is if you're getting enough sleep. First things you want to know when it comes to how to treat insomnia and how to get better rest is medicine is not the first option. 
the more and more we study things like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, the more and more we're seeing good data that there's a drastic improvement and a lot of the different measurements that we have about sleep from things that aren't medicines. If behavioral modification is not effective after three months, then you can consider a short trial of medications and I would not plan on using medication long term. I would not plan on using it nightly. I would not plan on using it more than maybe two months, three months at max. Um, this is this is not something you want to take. One of the problems with these medications is the more you use them, the more difficult it is to fall asleep on nights where you don't have the medicine. And so thus you need more medicine to continue to get sleep well. So it's very difficult to come off of. I'm not saying there's not a role for medications for sleep. I prescribe medications for sleep and select patients but we need to make sure that we've covered all the bases first. That is not a first line option. There's a lot of concern about the long-term effects of those medications. So if we need it, they're there, but if we can do it without medications, by far and away, that's the most common thing that we want to do. You should not use medication to treat long-term insomnia. There's some high quality evidence um, to support that. Specifically, some of the evidence that we want to consider is something called the Beers List. Beers is named after the physician, not the drink. Um, and the Beers List specifically talks about changes in your pharmacodynamics in physiologic anatomy for patients over 65. Um, so this is a list of medications that you want to be particularly careful about in patients over 65. You have less body water content, your renal function, liver function changes, and so you're not clearing medication the same way. Simultaneously, you're more susceptible to the impacts of the cognition shifts that come along with disorientation from medications. So plainly saying, you're gonna look at a medication differently in a patient who's over 65 versus under 65 just by the way that their body works. And medications for sleep, the Z medicines, benzodiazepines are all on the beers list. So you should be very careful about use, if any, specifically chronic use of those medications, including antihistamines, which can show some correlations to dementias in patients over 65. And this includes a lot of over-the-counter medications like z and Tylenol PM, those medications can be beneficial and people get some benefit with it, but I would not use those long term. These recommendations also come from the American Geriatric Society, who again highlights the beers list and some of the problems with those medications. I routinely have to stop some of these medications on patients that I have for over 65 because of the cognitive impairment. And it doesn't have to just be medicines for sleep. Sometimes it's some of these same medications that we use for pain. Think about things like gabapentin, things like Lyrica, which are great medicines and there's a role for them, but we need to be very careful about the cognitive impacts and the confusion and the disorientation that can come in patients who are taking those medications frequently, as sometimes when a medication in your body, when you take the medicine, isn't just that one molecule that we worry about. When that medicine gets to your liver and gets broken down, the metabolites or the breakdown products of those medications can also be effective in your body. So sometimes the metabolites can last for a substantial amount of time in people who aren't clearing the metabolites as quick as they clear the original medication. A classic example of this is a medication that we use called Librium, specifically in patients who are coming into the hospital for alcohol withdrawals. If patients can't clear the medication, aka they have decreased liver function, the metabolites of that medicine can last days and days, sometimes up to a week. And so we're using a short-term medicine that then is having long-term acting metabolites. So we have to be very careful about these medications on a regular basis. So let's talk about non-medication benefits for sleep. Patients that I have who sleep well typically describe their sleep almost like a recipe. They describe a, a series of events before they go to bed that they found the recipe that kind of works for them. So they'll say, well, you know, I started using a noise machine and that made a big difference. I started doing some stretching before bed and I didn't see as much impact there. Then I started doing some sleep affirmations and I noticed that that helped. And I started taking a hot shower at night and that helped me drop my body temperature and so I was sleeping a little bit better. And then I adjusted the temperature in my room and I considered weighted blankets and I started using sleep affirmations and I started praying before I went to sleep and meditation. And people who sleep well typically describe a couple of those things that they were able to do. Some of them worked, some of them didn't work so well, but the ones that work for them, they are able to incorporate into their sleep routine and that's how they started sleeping better. It's rarely that people just get in bed and they pull up the covers and they just stare at the ceiling and go, well, I hope this works. And they just conk out and sleep for eight hours. Typically people who sleep well are very intentional about their sleep. 
So if you're not there and you don't sleep great, that doesn't mean that you're not a good sleeper. Even if you've never been a good sleeper before, it might just mean that you haven't found that recipe for you and you can start working on it. And once you find that recipe, then you can continue to use it. Really, from a medical perspective, if you read any sort of evaluation on sleep and they say try non-pharmacologic interventions, aka not medicines for sleep for three months, they're talking about something called CBTI or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. And this is five different interventions that need to be used together um, that are not as effective if they're used individually to improve sleep and decrease a lot of the anxiety about sleep. And it's in studies, it's tremendously effective. I by far and away tell patients that they should start with CBTI for months and continue to work on it and improve their sleep hygiene and routine before they get to starting a medication. So let's talk about cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. The question is, does CBTI work? And indeed it does. In studies, not only does it improve sleep, but it also improves sleep architecture. It's not just the amount of sleep that people are getting, but the sleep that they are getting during that time frame is more effective. And that's one of the primary goals that we're having is not just knocking yourself out. There's a big difference between getting eight hours of sleep after drinking a fifth of Jack and getting good restful sleep. We want at least five days of sober sleep every week. If you are gonna have any impact on your sleep from any substances, including alcohol, I really suggest patients limit that to no more than two days per week. You need at least five days of sober sleep for your brain to get done the things that we need to see your brain get done. We're starting to see in studies with functional MRIs that above two days a week is where we start to see some of the thinning of the white matter in your cortex, which is where you have a lot of your emotional regulation and your decision-making capabilities. And if your brain is not able to get the sober rest that it needs, then you start having that impact on your brain function long-term. So let's talk about the five components of CBTI. Number one is cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring is primarily reducing anxiety about sleep and its impacts, changing the framework about thinking about sleep. You're not gonna be perfect every night when it comes to sleep. If you don't get a full eight hours, it's okay. There's a tremendous amount of anxiety that goes into sleep and restfulness and the more that people get frustrated, the more they try to sleep harder, the more difficult it becomes. So it's pivotal to focus on decreasing the anxiety about sleep in order to sleep better. Number two is stimulus control. Stimulus control is getting rid of anything that is gonna stimulate your brain in your bedroom. This is primarily thinking about having a TV in the bedroom, which I would never recommend. We really think about we only want the bed to be associated in your brain with sleep and marital activities. When you go into your room, it's going to set the tone in your brain as to what needs to happen. When you go into your office, your brain starts thinking work. When you go into your room, your brain needs to be thinking sleep. So if you have work that you're doing in your bed, if you're spending time on your phone, if you're stressed when you're in your bed, then your brain is still associating your bed with stress. So we want your bed to only be associated in your brain with relaxation and calm and rest. Never do work in bed. Number three component is sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene encompasses a lot of different things. This includes having a cold room, a noise machine. It includes not taking naps too late in the day, not having caffeine after 3 p.m. Um, these things are extremely important because your sleep is very delicate and you need things like melatonin and adenosine, which is a brain chemical that binds to a receptor and tells your brain that you're tired. When you drink caffeine, it displaces adenosine. So you don't feel that sleep drive and you don't feel that fatigue. Additionally, when you take a nap, if it's too long and too late in the day, then you're removing some of those adenosine molecules so you, you're not binding to sleep. You're not getting that restful signal from your brain that you need to. Number four is relaxation therapy. This improves sleep quality and latency and helps you fall asleep quicker. These are the techniques of sleep affirmations. I have a lot of patients who get in bed and as they're getting into bed, they're repeating to themselves, I'm gonna sleep well. This is gonna be a restful night's sleep. If I'm not asleep the entire night, that's okay. 
Even if I'm getting lighter sleep, my brain still has other things that it needs to do in light sleep, so I'm just gonna let my brain do the things that it needs to. Removing some of that anxiety before you get into bed is super important. I like relaxation because your brain is very impressionable when you sleep. I saw this a lot when I was doing a rotation. My father is an anesthesiologist, and in one group of patients, we would not give them any sort of expectations going under anesthesia. In another group of patients, we would tell them, when you're waking up, you're going to feel that we're using a tube to help you breathe. And the way that you can tell us that you're ready to wake up fully is if you take nice deep breaths. And in those patients, in the recovery room, we saw a big difference in outcomes. In the patients that we didn't give any expectations to, they felt the tube that was helping them breathe and they immediately reached for it and they were trying to pull it out. It created a lot of anxiety and confusion. In the group that we gave expectations to and told them not to worry and to take deep breaths, they were able to understand what to do, even on a subconscious level, and they didn't reach for the tube, they would breathe calmly, and we could extubate them quicker. When we talked to both of those groups in the recovery room, neither one of them remembered having the tube in their mouth or anything that happened in the operating room. They just remember waking up from recovery. So your brain is very impressionable when you sleep. So what you're telling yourself before you go to bed, what you're thinking about sleep, makes a tremendous impact as to what your brain can expect. This is why a lot of times if people have young kids or they are worried about the area that they live in, it's very difficult for their brain to get into deeper stages of sleep because they're keeping an ear out and they're worried about things that could be going on. We see this in physicians. They actually do studies to where physicians who are sleeping with a pager are not letting themselves get into the deeper levels of sleep because they know they have to listen out for their pagers. And on EEGs that we follow their brainwaves when they're sleeping, they don't hit those deeper levels of sleep. So it's the same for you. When you're sleeping, you need to reassure your brain that it's okay to get good rest, that it's okay to get deep sleep, that this is the time to do it. And that makes a big difference when you go to sleep. The last component of CBTI is sleep restriction. Sleep restriction is very effective but it needs to be approached with caution. Sleep restriction, I would propose, is used cautiously and it's primarily beneficial in patients who are changing time zones and trying to get back onto the regular schedule. Make no mistake that a good routine with sleep is probably the most impactful thing you can do for your sleep. Going to bed and waking up at the same time is important because your brain sets your entire circadian rhythm off of your sleep cycles. And so if I have a male who comes in the clinic and he thinks he has low testosterone, insurance won't pay for testosterone replacement until I get two 8 a.m. testosterone draws. This is because your testosterone peaks at 8 a.m. and then decreases the rest of the day. So if your brain never knows when 8 a.m. was and your circadian rhythm isn't set, then you don't get that testosterone peak. And so you need to be getting the same cycle of sleep. now. I'm not saying that nobody can do shift work. I'm not saying that no one can have um, altered shift work sleep cycles. However, the amount of people who can do well with that is very low. I, that's just not how our body was made to function. So going to bed, waking up at the same time is extremely important. I would use sleep restriction if you're trying to get your body used to that new cycle of sleep. In patients who are having trouble with sleep efficiency, and they're able to fall asleep well, but they're waking up multiple times through night, I think there can be a role in some moderate sleep restriction. In those patients, I would say, instead of the full eight hours or eight and a half hours of sleep opportunity, if they're finding themselves waking up and tossing a turning a whole bunch, I would consider sleep restricting down to, we'll say, seven hours, seven and a half hours of opportunity per night and making sure that your wake up time stays consistent and then your body becomes more efficient in that time. And so once the efficiency increases, then you can start lengthening out how much time you're giving your body sleep until you can get up to that eight hours and maintain that efficiency. And you'll notice if the, if, if the sleep opportunity gets too much, then you'll start to see the efficiency start to drop. I'll be extremely cautious about sleep restriction um, as a component of CBTI in patients who have underlying mood disorders. I would be very cautious. Make sure you're working with your doctor if you have a history of schizophrenia, if you have a history of bipolar disorder. Sleep restriction can cause some big changes in mood, especially can make people more vulnerable to psychotic episodes and uh, manic episodes. So patients need to be very careful, um, especially if you have medications that you're taking at night. 
um, you would not want to sleep restrict too much. Work with your doctor on this one, especially in those cases. I would not ever sleep restrict to less than six hours a night. I think if you're um, thinking that you need to sleep restrict more than six hours, that's dangerous even if you're taking naps in the afternoon. I wouldn't take more than about a 45 minute to an hour nap um, in the afternoons anyways, and I would never nap past 3 p.m., but sleep restricting less than six hours, I, I would just never do it. So let's talk about medications for sleep. There's a, a few medications um, that I would suggest starting with. Um, there's some medications that I would particularly avoid, um, but it's broken down in a couple different categories and we'll kind of go through it and some of the different uses that they can have. The first category is benzodiazepines, uh, otherwise known as sedative hypnotics. Um, there's some misnomers about this category. Um, there's a lot of medications like lorazepam and alprazolam, which is Xanax, that are used frequently for sleep induction especially, that are not approved for sleep. This medication can be problematic because in patients who are using it regularly, it becomes more difficult to get to sleep on nights where you don't have the medication. So you wanna be careful about using benzodiazepines for sleep. The only medications that are approved can have really long half-lives and the medication doesn't wear off when you wake up. And a lot of people describe next day somnolence and they feel groggy when they wake up. Um, the medication that I've used in a military setting is temazepam or Restoril. I think this medication is very effective. It is FDA approved for sleep, but even it has an 11 hour half-life. So you can run into some next day fatigue, which is probably one of the most common reports I got from my pilots in using this category versus the Z medications for sleep. Now, when we talk about medications for sleep, it's also worth mentioning what is being addicted to sleep medicines. Addiction is, in my experience, rarely patients who are crushing up and trying to snort a medication for sleep. It's often that people become very dependent on using a medicine for sleep. So instead of using it once every couple of weeks, if they're having a big change in their circadian rhythm or trying to reset that their sleep cycles, uh, these patients start using it two times a week, and then they find that it's more difficult to fall asleep on nights where they don't have it. They start creating anxiety when they don't have the medication. They're not using any other forms of CBTI or sleep hygiene in general to try to get better sleep. They're only relying on a medicine, and so they start using it more and more. And then they're needing the medication more and more. That is where the addicting component comes from. Um, there's typically not a euphoria that comes from these medications. I do have a lot of patients that have a tremendous amount of anxiety that will feel better, like less worry if they're taking medications, particularly benzodiazepines for sleep. And that's a slippery slope, especially with any medicine that people are using to shut their brain off. Whether it's a benzodiazepine, whether it's marijuana, whether it's alcohol, anything that you're using to make yourself get to sleep should be something you should approach with extreme caution. Those are things that really need to be reevaluated and you should talk to your doctor if you're finding that you're reaching for something, any substance, to help you get to sleep because you can't shut your mind off. That often is more of an anxiety problem than it is a sleep problem. And sleep is the symptom, it's not the problem. We need to treat the root cause and treat the root problem, and then the symptoms, AKA inability to fall asleep, will get better. And that's where the addiction component comes from is people are just treating symptoms, the problem gets worse, and then they're more reliant on the medication to continue to need more and more of a medicine that has a potential tolerance effect that you need more of over time to have the same benefits uh, because they never address the underlying problem in the first place. That's why it's so important to work with your doctor and make sure you're treating the actual causes of insomnia and not just putting band-aids on symptoms. Next medication category for sleep is the Z drugs. This is what most people think of when they think of medications for sleep. Um, these are wildly popular, things like Ambien, Lunesta. Um, these medications bind to the GABA receptor in your brain, which is a calming receptor. But there's some problems that we can see with these medications. Um, I have concern about the impact that these have on sleep architecture, especially in patients who are using it every night, which as we said, we don't wanna do. Um, Short-term use, it can be beneficial, but um, I rarely use these medications on a, on a regular basis with patients. One of the big concerns and one of the things that became famous about these category of Z medications for sleep is complex sleep behaviors. These are people waking up and driving cars, making food, potentially injuring themselves, um, and they don't know that things are going on. They're asleep, but they're able to wake up and do complex activities uh, while still being asleep. We use medications like sedative hypnotics and Z medicines in a military setting in order to help pilots readjust 
to a new um, sleep schedule, especially if we don't have a, a large duration of time that we can allow them to accommodate to a new time zone in order to get on a, a combat deployment routine. These medications are primarily used for a short term. There is a benefit with using these medications in a military setting. But to give you some reference, when I have F-16 pilots that are approved for this go no go program where we can use sedative hypnotics or Z medications for sleep, I'm talking to these people daily. I'm on the flight line. I'm seeing them before they fly. I'm talking to them regularly. We're going over side effects. They're getting a small number of medications at a time. They're telling me when they're taking medications. They're working with me on a daily basis and I'm seeing them face to face and not just prescribing them and somebody getting a prescription for three to six months and then coming back to the office later on. Um, this is a, a necessary program that we use, but again, we use it um, in a very controlled setting and we keep a very close eye on it. There are medications like anti-epileptic medications that we use. Um, these are often things like Lyrica or Gabapentin that we use to treat maybe chronic pain or uh, treat seizures that can be beneficial for sleep. When I was a resident, I had a DEAX license to work in an addiction clinic that was primarily for patients that were coming off of heroin. And in those patients, we got some great benefit with things like gabapentin because it helps with chronic pain. And we could use it also to get some of the less hard hitting stimulation on the GABA receptor to help with sleep. Not typically a medication that I would recommend starting with, although it can help with sleep. Um, I'd worry that you don't get as much sleep benefit and you maybe get more grogginess, fatigue, other side effects from some of these uh, medications. Useful in some categories, I wouldn't use it for everybody. There is a category of medications for sleep called tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, some of these medications can be really effective, especially in patients who are having trouble sleeping that also have coexisting depression or anxiety. Um, these tend to be some of the medications that I'll consider uh, as a first line in some patients because I don't see as much next daytime fatigue. One of the medications I like in this uh, category is called trazodone. Another medication is metrazepine or Remeron. These are medications that were originally developed as a medicine for mood, and then we just so happen to find that it happened to be also very effective for sleep as well. A newer category of medications for sleep that I think is really exciting uh, works on something called the orexin receptor. So orexin is a brain chemical that when it binds, it makes you feel more awake. So when we block this binding, then people don't have that awake signal, and so thus they get better rest. Uh, they feel fatigued more, and it seems to be effective with both sleep induction and with duration of sleep. This category is promising because there's less impact on sleep architecture. Your body needs to be able to cycle through about every 45 minutes to get light sleep and deeper levels of sleep because you're doing different things at different parts of the night and these medicines seem to have less of an impact. Primary medicines in this category we think about Davigo and Balsamra. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today about sleep. Sleep is super important. It's one of the three foundations that I always talk to my patients about. Um, I really pray that if you're struggling with sleep that uh, you'll continue to give effort and try to improve your sleep. It's really worth it. Trust me, the patients that I have who sleep better, it's worth it in their lives, and I think you'll feel a lot healthier as a result of that. Hopefully this video gave you some information that you can use. Um, if you have any questions or if you've had any tips that were helpful for you that helped you sleep better, leave some in the comments below. If there's other questions that you have about sleep that we didn't cover here, let me know. I'll try to cover it in another video. I'm Dr. Bishop. Thanks for watching.